Our speaker is Ms. Claire Seguin, who's Senior Manager of Clinical Compliance at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. She will be speaking on nursing care during blood transfusions. Thanks again to the hosts, especially to Dr. Sunny for inviting me to come all the way to Africa. I said yes right away. He caught me in the hallway and I, it was an instant yes. I'm here, as you can see, to talk about nursing care during transfusions. I'm going to just head along here to an overview. I am notorious for going off topic, so I'm going to try to be very good today and stick with my slides. Um, first, I'd just like to go over some best practices during transfusion, such as patient identification, which is a review a little bit, patient monitoring, which um, Professor Heather did cover really well, so I won't spend a lot of time there, blood transfusion documentation, um, and then I'm going to head right into nursing, um, the leadership role, especially how it relates to blood transfusion but and beyond. And then I'll also talk to you about the right type of environment your hospital has to have in order for nurses to perform at this level, okay? So I'm gonna start, I, I thought I would just give a perspective of Mass General Hospital. Um, I, you know, it's the largest and oldest hospital in the Harvard Medical School system. I think it's one of the oldest hospitals in the country. Um, it was chartered in 1811. We're actually over 200 years old, had a party. Um, there are th over 30,000 at this point healthcare workers, including 4,000 nurses, over 1,000 inpatient beds, and 30 satellite locations. Now, why is this important? Because um, as you will see in a minute, well, first, we can compare, right? Because we have large medical systems here. And, um, you know, I think that change is slow in these type of organizations and we can totally appreciate that when it comes to coming to Africa. Um, in addition, it's important to know this because one of my roles, and I'll talk about both of my roles at the hospital, is to oversee all of the adherence and compliance in all of these locations. So it's um, quite a big responsibility and it's something that uh, takes an enormous amount of work. So I'm gonna start off with my first job, that's me. This is not posed, I'm actually actively hanging blood for a patient in this picture and it was taken about a month ago. Um, and I work on an inpatient oncology unit and it's called Lunder 9. It's a beautiful new unit that a um, very generous donor gave to us. Um, we take care of very acute sick patients who are getting inpatient chemo as well as ma managing oncologi oncologic emergencies. So it's a pretty busy place. We actually administer a, g a large amount of volume of blood to these patients. Um, so basically the role in the U.S. for the nurse might be a little different than it is here in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, we do systematic assessments of health status of individuals, groups, and communities. We analyze and interpret data. We make informed judgments about specific elements mandated by a particular circumstance, so we actually can use nursing judgment to make clinical decisions for patients. We plan and implement nursing interventions for patients and write very detailed notes as to what those are. Um, we provide and coordinate health teaching at discharge and throughout the stay in the hospital. We evaluate outcomes. We watch our behaviors and see how that affects patients. We collaborate, communicate, and cooperate with all the members of the care team. And we're probably, I would say, the central piece of that. We're the closest to the patient and know the patient the best. And I wrote it last, patient advocate, but actually, in my opinion, it's the most important. Our assessments and our relationships with patients drive the care of the patient. Um, we always are speaking to people from all the different disciplines and letting them know subtle changes in patient behavior, assessments, et cetera. And I find my top part of my role when I'm in this role is um, patient advocacy. So this job I do on the weekend. So they call me the weekend warrior when I show up at work. So I have another role at the hospital, as you saw in the first slide, by my title. Um, and it's kind of, I don't think there's an equivalent role here, so I just thought I would explain a little bit of the background of how it came to be that seven years ago I got this job. 
So um, we have all these external signals in the U.S. It seems like you may have some here. Um, what did we talk about? The Health uh, Administration of Health? Or do I have it wrong? Ministry. The Ministry of Health. I was close. Okay. So it's very similar. We have a joint commission um, that accredits the hospital and gives us a nice stamp of quality approval. We have the Center for Medicare Services, which actually gives the hospital a large amount of money to care for patients over 65, as well as poor individuals. So um, we have the Department of Public Health, which is at the state level. Um, we look at serious events, like I talked about yesterday, which um, we get about 20,000 safety reports coming in through our office that get triaged, and some of those are mandatory to report externally for um, monitoring and actually hemolytic blood transfusions is on that list. Um, and then we just look at industry trends, and by that I mean if you make it, um, you know, if something makes it to an article in a newspaper or Ebola breakout, you know, we, we have to put a lot of focus in those areas too because they're sort of the buzz. All right, so um, what happened next is that those regulatory agencies have been there all along. So you say, well, what happened different seven, six, seven years ago that all of a sudden we need a new role in the hospital to manage this? So what happened is what, exactly what you saw in that earlier slide, that the expenditure of health care monies in the U.S. is kind of going like this, and the people supplying us the money said, prove it to us that all this extra expenditure is actually helping patient outcomes. So... We didn't do a very good job at that. We shared our data, and they said, oh, that's not what we expected. Why are we spending all this money and not getting the outcomes? So what happened was a lot of those regulatory agencies decided, you know what? We're going to change the way we do business. We're going to come into hospitals and really invasively look and watch the care being provided and read the notes and make sure they're doing what they're supposed to be doing before we give them money. So that's kind of how this came about. So just take note on this. This is March 17, 2007. We are still at the early stages of our journey. So do not feel that the U.S. and North America has this absolutely perfect yet. We're still at the beginning. We're trying to figure out how to make clinical performance and quality better in hospitals. So I like to pretend this is me here. I'm reading the paper, and I find out after one of these hospital inspections that Mass General Hospital is on the cover of the Boston Globe. You never want to be on the cover of the Boston Globe. Saying that our quality of care was not good. Doctors were not washing their hands. Medications weren't being stored safely or administered safely. It was embarrassing. It was terrible. And guess who paid attention? The president of our hospital and said, we need to do something about this. I'm going to show you. This is my boss here. He's crying because he said, oh, my gosh, I can't believe. <laughs> I can't believe this is what you've done. So what happened from there is they hired me, and we actually put a team together to make sure that that doesn't happen again, an enormous team that focuses on quality and safety throughout the hospital. So I think it's a little bit important to look how the goals get aligned here. So we have, you know, we make an annual plan for our department and nurse leaders as well um, that goes up to the Center of Quality and Safety, which are like senior vice presidents of the hospital. Um, we go through a semi-annual, I'm calling it a signal review, but basically I take all of the quality data that I've collected by watching performance and looking at outcomes and share it with the, leadership, the upper leadership of the hospital and then they make decisions on a quarterly basis where to allocate resources the best. So um, this is an ongoing cycle, so we, we don't stop. You don't do it once, you have to keep going. So on next, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the um, clinical care that nurses provide to patients, so I'm kind of flipping roles here. I'm gonna go back to Claire, the weekend warrior bedside nurse. So um, looking at that quality data, we can see that most transfusion reactions are happening from um, patient ID not verified at the bedside. And so our regulatory bodies paid a lot of attention to that and actually put the most stringent regulations on making sure that that identification of a patient is done. <clears throat> So in North America, we use wristbands, and I know you all got an opportunity to see those yesterday. 
So it, if you come into a hospital and you're going to get a treatment, you are also going to get a wristband with a unique identification number as well as your name and your date of birth. So there's no mistaking you are who you are. Um, we also, you know, and I would encourage here as well, it's a little different with pediatrics, you can engage moms. We actively engage the patient in asking who they are. So you don't say, you're John Smith, come with me, we're going to have a blood transfusion. You want John Smith to tell you his name. Um, and also we're working more towards, we have a couple areas that are using machine readable patient identification or barcode scanning, but we're only at the beginning of that journey. Um, our operating room, for example, does use that and we're working to that with the inpatient units. Um, from what I've noticed so far, it seems in sub-Saharan Africa, these name banding identification systems just aren't quite in place yet. So I'm showing you an example of what the current practice is in the U.S. So right now, um, how we identify patients for blood is a two-nurse process, actually. We have two nurses and the patient confirm their identification and sign off on that and document in the record. Um, future, as you can see, she's scanning the patient's bracelet. We've already got all medications being scanned in in this fashion to make sure that you're not going to make a mistake and give the wrong patient the wrong medication. You know, I'll just pause here for a second. I know we're here to talk about blood, but in my role I, co I cover a lot of different clinical areas as well. And I will tell you, just very recently, somebody had the wrong procedure done at the bedside because, you know, they walked in the room, the men, gentlemen looked alike, they were both about the same age, and they both had the name Frank. And so the junior doctor walked in the room and said, Frank, I'm here to take a biopsy. And, you know, patients trust us. So Frank said, sure. And it turns out later, wrong Frank. So just, it, just one example. It can happen very easily. Yeah. <laughs> Luckily, it wasn't any harm, not too much harm, but um, it could have been a lot worse. Um, so I know... Professor Heather already went through this, but I can't reiterate enough the nurse's role in um, identifying, I think you call, what is the name that you call it? Taco. Taco. It's a little different. We call it heart failure, but taco is perfect. And um, we notice because we can see the patient's breathing pattern change pretty quickly. We can hear the sounds that their breathing's making. So we know when somebody is overloaded. This would be more my patients in the adult world that I do see this. Um, to show you a couple of examples of our basic gravity infusion sets, um, the one to the right actually is the one that I use currently, which, actually, which has the saline on one side, the blood on the other, and that has a lot of benefits. So first, you can prime the whole tubing with saline first so that the blood isn't coming to the end and you risk losing any when you're trying to prime the tubing, which is really good. Um, we have a filter in the middle. And it also gives us the opportunity to run the blood and then stop it and flush through with saline if you need to, right? If it's an emergency and you need to stop it. And then I think maybe you might like this. At the end of the transfusion, you're not going to lose that 25 mLs or so that are still in the tubing because you can flush all that through with the other bag. Um, I noticed here, I didn't notice that you do that double bag system here. It seems like you do a single transfusion and you don't have saline coming through. Um, next, very important part of blood transfusion. So you know that blood you saw me holding at the very beginning of the presentation. This is actually now I'm at the patient's bedside. You're following me through my shift here. And um, I actually hung it. And you can see we're very fortunate. We have um, rate-controlled pumps. And actually, how, you see how it says red blood cells right at the top? I have a pick list on my pump. It's called a smart pump that actually knows the rate for an adult to run blood over. And I am only allowed within guardrails to adjust that rate between a certain amount, which is pretty amazing, right? It also lets me know if the infusion stopped, if the infusion's finished, all kinds of details. So we're very spoiled. I do understand. But where I came from, this is pretty modern. I've been a nurse for a long time, so I'll say 20 plus years. Um, we used to use these burettes. <laughs> we used to use these burettes where you could at least track volume in increments. So if I wanted to give 100 mLs an hour, I could drop 100 mLs, put a little bit of tape, 
use my watch, come back, drop another 100 mLs, and then I could um, watch that rate a little more carefully if the patient was particularly delicate. Okay, so back, like I said, I'm not going to go into a lot of details about the actual monitoring other than to say, look at the tools that you need to do these types of assessment. They are not complicated. It's a temperature and a blood pressure, respirations you need absolutely no tool for, and pulse. So um, the expectations in our hospital, I think it's the national recommendations, which is to do, do a set of vital signs at start because you need a baseline. You need one in, we, we say five to 20 minutes because our regulators don't like when we say 15 minutes and we do it in 16 minutes. So we kind of left a little flexibility. We do one in an hour and then at the end. So this is just an easy way to document. I would add nursing assessment of patients at this point isn't just limited to this. We're also checking the IV site to make sure it's not infiltrated, that the blood infusion is actually running as, inspected, as expected and not leaking in any way. So we use that opportunity to assess the patient in many ways. Um, from nursing literature in the US, we know that at a minimum, patients should be rounded on by nurses and assessed on an hourly basis. That has been proven to improve patient outcomes. So this sort of goes along with that model as well. So I'm just going to add all these in um, because we did go over those in real big detail yesterday. But if you think about it, having this, if, if you're training nurses at the very beginning stages to do these types of assessments, having a little guide like this would, would help them know when to notify the doctor or take the next steps or at least take the first step, which is to stop the transfusion, <laughs> you know? So we feel empowered to do that in North America. We're going to hit the stop button and, and start to um, do the right thing for the patient at that point. Um, we leave the line in place. We usually run some saline, stay with the patient, call for help. Um, and, you know, I like to ask a few questions there, right? Because obviously we want to make sure that we have the right patient for this blood. We have somebody with a, a, a fever and rigors at, at the, about the 15-minute point. So we want to do that. We want to see what their intake and output is, and we keep very careful track of that in our records as part of the nursing assessment, so it's pretty easy to do. Uh, looking for wheezing or strider for, or hives for allergic reaction, and um, considering bacterial contamination for severe chills, rig uh, for se severe chills, rigors, or hypotension. You know, it's funny, I have to cheat a little because this happens so rarely you know, our, our probably number one is the, the non-hemolytic fever reaction in the cancer patient. So that's what I see the most. All right, so now I am going to go to nursing leadership at the next level, okay, at the hospital level. So um, nurse leaders at MGH are transformational leaders, and they should be throughout the world. They're visionary, they're inspiring, strategic, engaging, respectful and trusting. This is the only way to engage the staff nurses to perform at that level that we just saw of, of detail. Um, we have some lovely uh, presidents, uh, female leaders and transformational leaders from Africa right up here on the slide. And I'm hoping, I know there was maybe four or five nurses in the room yesterday. I'm hoping you're watching this. Magdalene, is she here? Yes, so anyhow, this is very important. So this is where it begins. Um, we also need structural empowerment. So you can't have this great leader who is leading the team and they don't have enough resources or information or support from the institution um, to kind of get things done. So we need the opportunity to do that and take advantage of our um, we need the opportunity to take advantage of our, structure, our structures at the hospital. All right, so here we use a theoretical model. Actually, people may know Dr. Donna Bedian, who was actually a physician, who, who was one of the first people to take a look at quality in healthcare. And so they sort of, in the US, have adapted this model to nursing leadership in um, North America. So basically, they're saying you need the basic structure that I talked about, so the resources, the staff, the equipment, and the supplies, 
And this can be from what you have. It doesn't have to, you don't have to purchase more. You just need to know what you have and use it well, right? And, and take an inventory of that. The next piece is the process where you're going to do competencies and education and development and recognition. Recognition is very important to nurses, you know, because we, we work hard and for a long time we're not recognized for the work that gets done. And then at the end, you get to have empowered nurses who are satisfied and accomplished and professional and perform at a very high level. So that's sort of my message in general, that, that recipe is how you can change nursing practice. From there, so I'm going to come back to this. This is um, Deming, as I mentioned before, another person who I had studied quality. And he came up with a kind of quick cycle of change model for process improvement. And like if you don't, like I was saying, you, if you have all those big structures in place that I just spoke about, great. But if you don't, you can start small. You can start with small cycles of change at the unit level. So the first step in that is to plan. So you identify an opportunity for improvement by making observations. Measure your current performance to make sure that this just isn't a one-off observation that you made, that you actually have a problem. You're going to set some goals and develop an improvement plan. Um, the do step, you will implement the improvement plan by identifying resources and piloting the solution. Um, the check, which I had mentioned um, is where most of us fall down because we think we've done a great job and we just don't go back and see did the performance that we hope to affect, it, are people actually doing what we planned? And um, you know that's a very important step to standardize the process and monitor to sustain improvement and then act. So once you make that second round of observations, you go back and act on them and either make modifications or just keep measuring and making sure that everyone is doing what they need to do. So I thought it might be nice if I highlight uh, a recent case to just show an example of that type of um, process improvement project. And it actually just so happened to have to do with blood transfusion, so that was great. Um, so the problem was that we had the documentation, so people were definitely doing the monitoring around blood transfusion and the assessment and the vital signs, but they weren't always documenting them. So the records were incomplete. Um, we, we checked a pulse on our current performance and realized that all the required elements were only present 38% of the time, which is pretty dismal. Um, then we um, know as an underpinning fact that correct monitoring improves transfusion safety. So it was very important for us to get this right. Actually, we had a good amount of heat from those external people that I spoke about, um, the CMS in particular and Joint Commission, um, to make sure that we did this right. So we had a little external pressure as well. And so our project team made, it, made an aim. By June 2014, we would improve documentation of blood transfusion monitoring to 90% or greater. So for a strategy, so our planning, we had um, put together an interdisciplinary team. It's very important that you consider all people that might be involved with the process. In this case, that was folks from the lab. It was Dr. Sunny, myself, nursing le other nursing leaders, nurses from the bedside, quality nurses. It was quite a big team. Um, they started with the policy just because it got people talking and kind of understand what current practice was and also to see if there was any way we could make it more current. Um, it, the parts of the policy that had to do with nursing specific assessments, we made sure that all the nurses in the room had buy-in and agreed upon it at every time we spoke. And um, the bedside staff input was particularly important. Um, so the process improvement piece was we piloted a couple inpatient units. Um, we did a broad educational campaign. You know, there's some ideas here. Um, it can be social media, like you talked about. We actually do in the hospital a method where we take um, the PowerPoint presentation that just has a couple quick slides and make them big and go from unit to unit and do an in-service at lunchtime for the nurses, which is a really nice kind of easy way to do it. It gets people talking, they're relaxed, they're eating their lunch, they get a few slides, they're happy. 
Um, we also did some at the elbow training too for those, those uh, wards that had a high volume of blood use and did particularly poorly on our, um, our data search. So did that as well. We did some return demonstration, as I said, at the elbow. And the kind of real key here is that there was audits and accountability by nurse leaders. So we didn't just say, bedside nurse, you need to do this. We actually held their nurse director, I think you call it nurse in charge here, um, we held them accountable and gave them their data and said, this is how your staff is doing. And if they were a poor performer, they were expected to do better. So um, you're not going to believe this, but the result of all that work was just a simpler form. The fields, there were too many fields and people didn't know where to fill things out. And um, we basically got a, a, an improvement up to 97% compliance with monitoring of the assessments around blood transfusions, which is great. But as you can talk to Dr. Zeke, it's not over. We're still going back and we're still looking and we're still monitoring. So a um, couple little pieces I'm just going to add. I know I kind of touched on the theoretical model for nursing, but there is some I just reflected upon myself and I, you know, I obviously love what I do. I love being a nurse. I love taking care of patients. And I thought, what makes me feel that way every day when I go to work? And I came up with four things that I would really pick. So one was autonomy. You know, I have a state of self-governing and exercising professional judgment. I have nursing literature that I can call upon, and I feel supported in that. So that would be number one for me. Um, Nurse-physician relationships. Um, we have very close relationships with the doctors that we work with every day. We have interdisciplinary rounds where the doctors and the nurses discuss the case and the patient together and give valuable input from different, um, different views. Um, I also have control over my practice. You know, we have a state practice act that sort of gives me some guardrails as to what I can do and what I can't do. But I don't ever feel pressured to do something that I feel like is not within my scope of practice, or vice versa. I don't have someone telling me, you're not supposed to be doing that, because I know that it is within my scope of practice. Um, and the last step is communication. You know, I, I need to have the information about the patient available to me all the time. And I also need to know what hospital initiatives, initiatives are going on and what I can expect on any, on any given moment. So I think one way that um, you know, we could share good nursing practices across, um, I, we were thinking that the nurses in the African, is there a possibility to have nurses in the African Society of Blood Transfusion? And I would say you know, they are involved at that level in North America um, in quality review and quality management. Um, they're involved as patient safety champions, and I, I do know some nurses here are getting trained as champions, which is wonderful. And um, could they, is there room for them in transfusion committees and, and membership and leadership? If you, ex, you know, if you want nurses to perform at a level that they're doing sort of advanced assessment, they need to be at the table at these committees when things are being discussed so they get buy-in, to get buy-in. And then I thought for us, like how can we connect? I, I can get on a plane and come very far and come visit you all, which I hope to do again. Um, but also, is there other opportunities that we can learn and share, such as Skype, or is there a digital way to do a learning conference, which we're going to make this available? Um, and you know, overseas training as transfusion safety officers, as we described too. So in conclusion, um, nurses play a vital role in patient safety during blood transfusion. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, nurses monitor patients. They recognize acute transfusion reactions and take first decisions, including, I know some people had this reporting and uh, making sure that a workup gets done on the patient. Um, nurses are organizational leaders, and there's all kinds of creative and new roles that you can think about to use nurse leaders in. Um, they have a lot of clinical knowledge and they can offer a lot at the table. And by working together, a best professional practice environment is created and the highest quality of patient care is given. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.